Deck the halls with boughs of holly. Fa la 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 la. Tis the season. Well, good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you guys this morning. Smiling's my favorite. No, make work your favorite. It's great. Good to see you today. So the title today goes along with that, which is, I know, am I talking loud? I'm sorry. Uh, the title is How to Enjoy Every Day. And some of you are thinking, I don't need to enjoy, I just need to survive every day. But I'm hoping that you'll understand by the time you leave here how you really can, regardless of the circumstance, regardless of what's happening, regardless of how bad the news is that you've gotten or or what's happening today, or what you're worried about tomorrow, that you can live in joy today. So I want to use a piece of the Christmas story. We're going to do this every week until Christmas. By the way, Christmas Eve, for those of you watching online, we'd love to see you, uh, is a great time to invite people who haven't been to church in years. I was actually invited to a party last night where a lot of people that were at the party don't go to church. <laughs> So, which would have been better if the person hadn't introduced me as his pastor to every single person, but it was, it made for some good conversations anyway, because I got, hey, you're normal, and, um, um, but anyway, so, so listen to this verse, most of you know this verse from Luke chapter 2, and this is the scene where Gabriel shows up to the shepherds. And let me give you a little background before, before I, I read the verse, and that's this. Listen, shepherds were not popular people. Not only were they not popular people, they were seen as criminals and untrustworthy. They weren't allowed to testify in court because they were seen as un They couldn't go to church. They, can you imagine, like, somebody standing at the door going, oh, I'm sorry, you shepherd? No, you can't come in. I mean, that's what happened to them. If they showed up for church, they were told, you can't come to church. I'm sorry. Go home. And so this is who God decides is going to tell about him. Now, think about this. You, you, you probably haven't given it a lot of thought. He could have sent angels to tell everyone about Jesus coming. But he didn't. So who did God chose? God chose shepherds. Do you realize shepherds were not even allowed in the temple? And so here's the big deal. They weren't allowed in the temple. So what happened? The temple came to them. The whole story of Christianity is that you really can't do anything to earn your way to God. You are not good enough. You will not do enough good things. You can't get the checklist good enough. You were born broken, and only God can put you together. And it's not putting yourself together and coming to him. It's him coming to you and you saying, I'm broken. And he puts the pieces back together. So we pick up this story, and Gabriel appears to the shepherds. The shepherds are out in the field. It is dark. They can see beady little eyes looking and thinking, lamb chops. And they're the only thing in between the lamb chops and the wolf. And here they are. They're in charge of protecting. So they're watching. It's dark. They're squinting in the darkness. It's quiet. And the Bible says that Gabriel appeared. And I'm sure freaked them out. And I love this. Listen, I almost can see the scene in heaven of Gabriel going, okay, come here. Come here. Angels, come here. Come here. Stand right here. Watch these shepherds. You got us. Come here. Come here. Behold! Right? So he says, do, and then, he, and then Gabriel says, don't be afraid, which I love that because it's like, it's like going up behind somebody going, boo, don't be afraid. So he says, don't be afraid. I bring you good news. This word good news is where we get the word gospel. It's also where we get the word evangelism. And uh, most evangelists are not really telling you good news, but that's another story. But, but gospel, and then it says of great joy. That word great joy, if you're an 80s child, you love this word because the word mega. And if you were in the 80s, this hasn't been, you know, like awesome is still used. Like everybody from the 80s still says awesome. But there was a time in the 80s that everybody said, hello, is it me you're looking for? Oh, wait, wait, that's another thing. But there was a time in the... 
There was a time in the 80s, though, that everybody would say mega, and you would add mega to stuff. So, like, even if you said awesome, you were like, dude, it's mega awesome. How was that concert? Oh, man, mega. Doesn't even mean anything. But if you're from the 80s, you're like, yeah, what's wrong? That's a good use of a piece of a sentence, a piece of a word. Not even a word, just mega. Well, here's what's cool. When the angel appears, he says, I bring you good news of mega joy. Mega joy. And then he continues, that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior's been born to you. What's really cool about this is you can find this in Isaiah. We have copies of Isaiah in the Dead Sea Scrolls that date before Jesus ever came and prophesy all about Jesus. Uh, prophesy not only about his birth, but also his death. The, the Magi and the, and the wise men that worked for uh, the king actually knew where Jesus was going to be born from Isaiah. And so they said, a Savior's been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And then you know the rest of the story because you saw it in Charlie Brown. <laughs> this will be a sign to you. You'll find the babe wrapped in swallowing clothes. Or if you have an NIV version, pieces of cloth lying in a manger, right? So, so what, is this ha what happens here? He goes to normal shepherds who honestly had a tough life. Who, who did jobs that you and I probably would not want to do. Who dealt nightly with things that you didn't want to deal with. Who were seen as outcasts. And he says, here's some joy for you. And the Bible even said after they told about him, they went away rejoicing. But you know what they had to go away to rejoice? They had to go right back to their same situation. So they were in the exact same situation, but now they were there with mega joy. So regardless of what's going on in your life, I want you to know that you can walk in joy if you'll believe God. And, and if you will let go of the fears in your life, and if you'll hang on to the faith in your life and the things that God said, and if you will believe what God says instead of believing all the things going through your mind that aren't from God, then you will be able to walk in joy. But I'm going to tell you a really dumb story because your pastor can be dumb. Well, I'm actually going to tell you two. The first one is just to tell you about my friend Tim Goff, who was in a coma over Thanksgiving for four days. He is doing great. Not only is he doing great, he actually, the other day, came to a, a, Ricky was in a basketball game with Titusville High, and Tim and his wife came and sat right next to me. And Tim is doing so good that I harassed him. So they're watching. By the way, my son Ricky scored five points, took a charge, stole the ball three times. It was awesome. Just so you know. Not that I'm proud. So I looked over at Tim, and this is how kind your pastor is, because I'm a kind-hearted person. I believe sarcasm is one of the spiritual gifts. It's just not mentioned. Maybe in the Greek, I'm looking. So I looked at Tim. I go, Tim, you know, your wife thought you were really sick. And I said, you know, we all thought you were going to die. And he's like, I know. I know, but I'm doing great. I go, I know, but you're not getting anything for Christmas. She took everything back already. So. <laughs> he goes, good one. Good one. That's good. That's good. So yesterday, I was in charge of getting mulch for our Boys and Girls Club project. So I was so proud of myself. I left home at 6.45. I show up at Lowe's. I don't have a truck. And everybody says, borrow a truck. Well, pastors are told, by the way, by every other pastor, don't ever buy a truck if you're a pastor. Because you might as well just put Ryder on the side or U-Haul. Because you're going to be giving it to everyone in the church. So I have a car. I was able to fit 25 bags of mulch in my car. And then drive to the Boys and Girls Club on I-95. Hey, how's it going, man? I'm doing good. <laughs> Listen, man, I got this package put in this car. It's awesome. I know you're jealous, man. It's okay. Every bump, right? So I drive the 20 minutes to Boys and Girls Club. I pull in. And I look at the mulch. And I have purchased the wrong 25 bags of mulch. Thank you. That response was much more merciful than first service. They just pointed and laughed. 
So, you know, people are kind of, and, and of course, listen, I grew up, uh, my dad owned a construction company and he did not want us to be construction workers, so he did his best to make us miserable our whole lives. For some reason he thought, uh, rather than being a millionaire construction worker, being a pastor would be a lot easier on my brother and I, so we're both pastors. We have this conversation on occasion like, what was dad thinking? We're not, but anyway, but I know I'm where God wants me. I had somebody say something last time, I said, oh, I'm just kidding. Mostly. Okay, so. Um, so everybody gets there. I have to unload. I have some of the tools underneath the mulch. So I have to unload about eight bags of the mulch, pull the tools out. About eight people showed up early for the Boys and Girls Club. I said, I'm sorry, I've got to go. I said, it should only take me about 40 minutes. i got to drive to Titusville, exchange this. I'm pretty sure they'll just let me exchange it. <laughs> So I drove back to Titusville. <laughs> Pulled in. I went to the guy who waited on me. I said, man, can I just exchange these? I got eight people already there waiting for me. I, I had to drive another 20 minutes back here. Can I just exchange these? For no, no, you got to go into customer service. Okay. So now you got to understand, I, you have to understand that I knew the sermon I was about to preach. So I'm trying to practice it. By the way, if you, gentlemen, let me just tell you something about patience. If you continue to fail the patience test, God gives retakes. So I wanted to pass this one. So I go to customer service. And by the way, ladies, I know you don't get this, but guys hate to return anything. I, my first thought was maybe I could just drop that off. And worry about it later. Just buy new mulch. And maybe one day I'll go in and say, you know, I left 25 bags of mulch here one day. But no, I knew. I went to customer service. As I showed up, just one person in line. I'm like, oh, hallelujah. I walked up. The lady took care of it in like 10 seconds. That lady walks off. I walk up to the thing. I'm like, great. Because I knew all they have to do is swipe my card, take my receipt, bink, you're out of there. The lady goes, um, he's going to have to take care of you. I'm going on my break. Walks off. Oh. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. So there's nobody in his line. So I'm like, oh, praise the Lord. She says, hey, you're going to have to take care of him. And the guy turns around, looks at me, says, okay. Right then a man walks up. I don't know what he needed. But this guy started printing stuff. Then, I am not kidding, this is not an, I would love to tell you that this is an exaggeration. For some reason, he had to walk over to the little case they have in front. I don't know what's in that case, but he had to walk there. And I am not exaggerating. This, and I'm standing up, I almost filmed it. I was standing up with my camera, and I said, I really want to film this because I know this is going to be a great story for church. I'm just, <laughs> literally, this is not. I just watched him. He went over. He opened the case. Walked the same speed. Walks back. Helps the guy print stuff. And I'm like, man, I got people waiting for me. And I'm feeling dumber and dumber. Because I always feel, I already feel dumb because I bought the wrong thing. It's my fault that I'm not there. Everybody else is working. And here's the pastor. <laughs> right? So, you know. Right? So, all this is rolling through my head. So he's almost done with that guy. I'm like, okay, it'll be just a second. Another guy walks up. He helps that guy. Now I'm moving into, hey, man, I'm in Miami mode. You're going to go down. Right? So by the way, I'm from Miami. If people didn't know that, I'm not. All my, all my amigos. Que mala suerte. Anyway, so that means well, bad luck, for those of you who don't know. So he, he, he was on that guy. I start, at this point, I'm like laughing. And, I'm, and of course, I'm thinking, maybe I can do it for myself. You know, I'm doing the whole, I could just swipe my, I probably could do it. I could. <laughs> the guy finally comes over and says, can I help you? I said, I'm really sorry. I said, I'm an idiot. I bought the wrong thing. I got eight people waiting for me. You know, basically, can we hurry? And, and um, you know, I got this. I said, it should be easy. I just have to exchange these for the others. He goes, where's the mulch? I said, it's in my car. He goes, oh. Well, you have to unload it and then come back, get back in line. Oh, no. No, I, 
thankfully, the lady came back at that point and basically said, don't, don't make him. Just, I said, I promise, I'll give you my license, I'll give you blood, whatever you want. Just, I'll unload it. And load it. I promise, you can watch me, whatever. And so they exchanged it. I went, I had to unload all the mulch, load up the new mulch, and then drive back down to the Boys and Girls Club with the right mulch. On the way back, here's what went through my head, okay? Why is it so easy to focus so much when we do something dumb about how dumb it is what we just did? And how we could, didn't have to do that. And we try to relive it like we can fix it by going over and over in our minds, over and over, oh, I can do that. And then why do we think that other people are thinking much? I, don't, I really don't think anybody at the Boys and Girls Club was thinking, my oh, pastor, I hate his guts. But, but in my mind, right? And in your mind, you think, right? And on the way back, I said, you know, Lord, I know you're trying to teach me. I don't know that I'm learning, but... But I, I'm just going to trust you. And so I just, I just relaxed on the way back. And I said, it doesn't matter. Can't do a thing about it. Uh, you know? And, and it went great. And then we, we redid their mulch. We, we painted their, we sealed all their benches. Had a great crew. I think we ended up with 12 or 14 people. Or uh, pastorally, like 100. And, um, and they were just, you know, and, and did a great job. And it wasn't a big deal. Except to me, for those moments that I was trying to fix and control everything. And I say all that to say this, if you and I are going to have joy, we've got to do two things. We've got to take these steps of letting go of fear, fear of what other people think, fear of our future, fear of other things. So here's steps to daily joy. You're going to let go of fear, so we're going to talk about that, and then you're going to walk in faith. You're going to walk in faith. Oh, that's over here. So, you might need a pen, by the way. I'm going to give you some practical things that aren't in the notes. So, if you want to uh, take a pen out or, or uh, whatever, you can watch it online later. All right. So, how do I let go of fear? Number one, let go of the past. Even in that dumb story, I found myself seeing myself going into Lowe's and buying the wrong mulch and thinking, oh, if I had only done better, why did I even waste any time? And by the way, the, the thing as I stood in line I was thankful for to try to reprogram my mind was, Lord, thank you that it actually hasn't cost me any money for this mistake. Other than driving an extra hour, it hasn't cost me anything. In Isaiah it says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. That's so much easier to say than to do. And then, but here's what he says, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. Basically, God says, I will bring life where there's death. Don't you worry. I'm going to do something new, and it's going to bring uh, 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 life in the middle of what has been dry and dead. And so quit thinking about what you did wrong. Quit thinking about what somebody did wrong to you. It's time to move forward because you can't move forward and live in the past. And how do we do that? Romans 13 is a great thing. But clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus. In the Greek, this word for clothe is this really cool word, and it means to immerse. It's like you sink into the clothes. It's like really comfortable clothes. You're like, yeah. It's like that you get that blanket on a cold day out of the dryer, right? And, and, you, and you wrap it around you, and you go, oh, yeah. That happens like once a year in Florida. Like once a year, right? Okay. So, but clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and forget about satisfying your sinful self. And here's the deal. If you're a believer, what happens is those old sinful habits follow you. The Bible says you're no longer a sinner. You're a saint that's saved by grace. But those old habits continue to follow you. And so what does he say? He says, forget about satisfying your sinful self. Quit focusing on those things. Quit focusing on the mistakes you made. And instead say, God, I want to clothe myself with you. So here's the practical thing. When you find yourself focusing on the past, whether it's somebody that hurts you or like me, something dumb you've done, Thank God for what you learned. God, thank you that through that experience I learned this. God, thank you through that experience, this is what I learned. Or this is how I overcome. Or this now is something I can use. 
Lord, thank you for that. Number two, let go of negative people. Now, last night, a wife raised her hand and pointed to her husband. <laughs> you cannot let go of your husband. Till death do us part. Now, you might have to kill him, but... <laughs> Let go of negative people. I love this verse, Titus 3. But stay away from those who have foolish arguments and talk about useless family histories and argue and quarrel about the law. And this was people who were arguing about all kind of technicalities in Old Testament law. And then he said, those things are worth nothing and won't help anyone. After a first and second warning, avoid someone who causes Arguments. Now, this word arguments is this really cool Greek word, and it basically means avoid people who manipulate. Avoid people who manipulate. Do you have somebody in your life that loves to argue? So you're like, yes, a teenager. Okay, we're going to talk about that in a second. But you and I, we all know somebody who just loves to argue. And I'm not talking about, about things that are important. I'm not talking about they're, they're trying to make a point about something that matters. I'm talking about they love to argue about everything. The Bible says, warn them and warn them again. And then put up a boundary. Put up a boundary. In Proverbs 22, it says, do not make friends with a hot-tempered person. Do not associate with one easily angered. Time out. Gentlemen, I want you to hear me carefully because I've given this advice a thousand times. Ladies, you might have this too. But guys, we tend to only have one good emotion, and that's anger. We're not good at any other ones, but boy, we got that one down. If you have angry outbursts, you are a sledgehammer to your world, to your family, to your friends, and you need to stop. And if you can't stop, you need to get help. One of the best books you can read, I'm going to tell it to you, so listen carefully. It's called The Anger Workbook. If you struggle with angry outbursts, start with that book. But before you continue to hurt people and destroy your life and destroy other people, please go get help. Come and see me. Come and see a counselor. I'm free, but I'm not that good. Okay? Get yourself help and, and because your anger will destroy not only your life, but everybody's life around you. And some of you have been on the receiving end of that. And here's what I'm going to tell you. Here's the practical part. If you have somebody who likes to argue or manipulate or is angry, you need boundaries. Boundaries are not saying I don't love you. Boundaries are a way of saying I love you, but here I'm not going to allow you to do this. So when it comes to a child and they keep talking to you, you can say, you're not going to talk to me that way. If you continue to talk to me that way, here's what's going to happen. Will you just hate my guts? And you're making your choice about what you do. You don't, now, by the way, you can do that with an adult too. If you continue to talk to me that way, here's what's going to happen. Or I can't keep hanging around you if you're going to keep trying to argue with me about that. By the way, you know how many people it takes to argue? If you don't participate, an argument doesn't happen. They're just talking to themselves. Loudly maybe, but... So the practical thing is, hey, make a boundary... Let people know, I, I, I'm not gonna, I'm, I, don't have to, I don't have to tolerate your anger. I don't have to tolerate your manipulation in my life. Here's the boundary. If you will do this, then I will do this. But if you don't do this, I'm not doing that. Jesus even had boundaries. Number three, this one's so easy to tell other people because their worries are little, right? Let go of worries about the future. Therefore, the Bible says, do not worry. That word for worry here is the word distracted. Because the idea is that when you're worrying about something, you can't pay attention to what's right next to you. On the way to church, I tend to start focusing on the message and what I need to change and what I need to fix and what I need to do and people that are talking in the back. I tend to think about all those things. And it's very easy when you're driving somewhere to get focused. And Lydia was sitting next to me. And I remember as I was thinking through the message, hey, focus on the present. And I reached over and I held her hand. And she looked over and went. <laughs> if you are busy, distracted with the future, you can't pay attention to the now. Do not worry about tomorrow. Why? Because tomorrow will be distracted about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And nobody struggles with that sentence. Anybody want more trouble in here? Anybody? I'd like, Eric, I don't have enough. No. 
You're good, right? I'm good. I'm good. Proverbs 12, 25, and I'm going to show you how you've read this verse wrong your whole life. If you've read it. <laughs> Some of you are like, never heard. Worry is a heavy load. So we got that, right? When you're worried, you're freaked out, you're stressed out, your blood pressure's messed up, you get gray hair. Somebody came up to me. I haven't seen you in a while. Man, you've gotten gray. <laughs> what a blessing you are. Thank you. <laughs> Go in peace, my son. <laughs> Worry is a heavy load. But listen to this. But a kind word cheers you up. And we read that, and here's what we think, okay? You and me are the same this way. Hopefully not every way, because then you'd be like, no, I'm not. Okay, so... Worry's a heavy load, but a kind word cheers you up. And if you're like me, you think, yes, when somebody says something kind to me, it cheers me up, right? The verse doesn't say which direction that kind word comes from. And too often, we're waiting for someone to cheer us up. The Bible doesn't say, wait for somebody to cheer you up. It says a kind word cheers you up. It doesn't say who gives it. So guess what? If you are feeling a heavy load of worry, then go out of your way to give a kind word or a kind deed to someone else. So here's the practical part. When worry comes, think this. What's in front of me right now? So my, me on the way to church, it's my daughter's in the car with me. What's in front of you and what can you do? You can always smile. Buddy the Elf has one thing very right. He said, smiling's my favorite. It should be your favorite. Some of you should tell your face that you have good news. <laughs> so funny, somebody, because I come up a lot of times, you know, during the songs, you know, and I look and people are like, Jesus, be the center of my life. Thanks for all you've done today. Tell your face. <laughs> And you and I are the same way. If you walk past somebody and they're like, right? You instantly are like, what's the matter with them? But if they walk past you, they could be having the worst day. But if they look at you and go, good morning. You're like, oh, good morning, man. <laughs> so why don't you be that person? Now I'm not talking about being a fake Christian person like, hey, good morning, brother. How are you? <laughs> it's a small world after all, right? <laughs> but say a kind word. Give a big tip. Next time you're depressed, go to a restaurant, buy a coffee, and give them a $5 tip. I, you know, go out of your You're like, well, that's a waste of money. Listen, some of you would be better off wasting money that way and blessing somebody. All right, so how do I walk in faith? Number one, be thankful no matter what happens. You can be thankful anywhere. You can be thankful in the hospital. You know how I know it? I was in the hospital. You can be thankful when you think you're dying. Do you know how I know that? Because one day, I thought I was dying. My doctor thought I was dying. I had surgery at 3 o'clock in the morning. And I was thankful. When my doctor came in, I could barely talk. And I said to him, you don't normally come in at 3 in the morning, do you? No, Eric, I don't. I said, well, thanks for coming in. <laughs> He's like, I'll write that down. That's probably your last note. <laughs> So, 1 Thessalonians 5, let me give you my version first. Rejoice sometimes. Pray occasionally. Give thanks when things are going well. Right? But that's not what it says. It says, rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in, what's the next word? All circumstances. Why? For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You want to do God's will? Be thankful. Pray. Rejoice. Rejoice means to renew your joy. Get your joy going again. Because we all struggle with joy. All struggle with joy. You have circumstances that happen in your life that try to steal your joy. But you're not, it's not being stolen. You're giving it away. Amen. Let the peace of Christ. This word for peace is really cool. It's the idea of pieces being put back together. So, so when the Bible says peace, it's the idea that God takes the pieces of your life. So it says, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart since as members of one God, excuse me, of one body, you are called to peace and be thankful. So here's the practical application. Emotions come. Life is difficult. Circumstances happen. So when you fall to pieces, let God put the pieces back together. 
And sometimes you just need to say, God, I'm in pieces. God, this, this emotional situation, this difficulty, this struggle, I feel like I'm falling apart. You ever use that? This word peace is the idea that you're falling apart. But God has a way of pulling you back together. Are you walking in peace? It's not your circumstances that are keeping you from peace. It's not what's happening around you that are keeping you from peace. It's because you need God to help you put the pieces back together. It doesn't mean you won't struggle. It doesn't mean you won't get angry. It doesn't mean you won't get hurt. It doesn't mean you won't be afraid. I think the shepherds, don't be afraid. Oh, easy for you. Let God put you back together. Number two, study and obey his word. But the truly happy people, wouldn't you like to be one of them? But the truly happy people are those who carefully study, and that's the idea of looking into God's perfect law that makes people free, and they continue to study it. That means they spend time in the Word. They, they come to church and they try to hear what somebody's saying so they can say, oh, I never thought of that verse that way. They study the Word. They look into it. They discover what it says. They dig into it. And then it says, God's perfect law that sets people free and they continue to study it. They don't forget what they heard, but they obey what God's teaching says. Those who do this will be made happy. Now listen, you need to know something. If you're not a Christian... Then you, when you do whatever you want, you, you won't be running from God. You, you've already away from it. But if you're a Christian and you're sinning and you're doing whatever you want, then you're going to feel it. You're, you're going to begin to lose your joy. You're going to begin to lose your peace. If you call yourself a Christian and you do whatever you want and you don't feel a twinge of trying to make yourself right with God, then you might not be a Christian. Because you can't continue to run from God as a believer and live however you want and think, oh, I'm just a Christian. You might not be a Christian, and that's okay. You need to figure it out and say, God, if I'm not, would you show me? But if you're a believer and you're running from God, you will be miserable. So here is a step for you. Be obedient to God. Now that sounds really complicated, but most obedience is very simple. If you yell at somebody in the morning, you're probably not loving them. I mean, love God and love people. Those are the two commands. It's pretty easy to figure out when you're not loving people. If you watch me in traffic, I'll give you an example, okay? So, so we have to learn that and say, God, you know what? I'm sorry that I wasn't loving when that person pulled out in front of me. God, I'm sorry I wasn't loving to my children in this situation. God, I'm sorry I wasn't loving to my employer, my boss, my friend. Father, forgive me and help me to walk with you. Help me to be obedient to you. So the step is, take that step of obedience. Number three, receive his joy. This is the simplest point, and I would say that probably none of you praise this today, but it's the easiest one to do of all the things. I told you this, Jesus said, so that my joy, that's where we get the word charis, that's where the counseling center of our church that's also in Orlando, they get their name from, it's the idea of calm delight. I told you this so that my joy may be in you, and your joy may be complete. Jesus said, even though all this bad stuff to the disciples is going to happen, I'm letting you know what's going to happen. Why? Because you can have my joy in the middle of this difficulty. My joy. Not your joy. Not just positive thinking. Not just thinking the right thing. But my joy. Where does that come from? Galatians 5.22. The fruit of the Spirit is, of course you know love, and then joy. So it's one of the fruits of the Spirit. So here's the practical tip. You ready? Lord, would you give me your joy? When's the last time you prayed that God would give you his joy? Now, that's not an absence of circumstance. It's not an absence of what's going on. It's not a non-reality of difficulties in your life. It's not going through life and ignoring problems. But it's understanding that even in the middle of difficulty, you can have joy. Number four, we did this yesterday. Serve others and overcome. We all have different gifts. Not all of you could get up here on stage. But some of you are artists. I cannot draw stick figures. I, I said that before we did this art thing. And some people said, oh no, anybody can be an artist. The lady doing the artwork said, anybody can be an artist. And then I drew and she said, it's a good thing you're a pastor. I said, yeah, next time I'll take pictures. So if you invite me to the wine and whimsy or whatever thing, I'm not doing the whimsy. I probably won't do the wine either. We all have different gifts. 
each of which came because of the grace God gave us. The person who has the gift of prophecy should use that gift in agreement with faith. And then I summarized here. The serving should serve. Teaching should teach. Encouraging others should encourage. If it's giving to others, give freely. If it's a leader, you should try hard. If you have the gift of mercy, do it with joy. But listen to this last sentence. It's so important. I wish every Christian paid attention to this one sentence. It would change churches. Do not let evil defeat you, but defeat evil by doing good. Too often, we think we're going to be defeat evil by talking about it. By praying, just praying about it. Or just praying against it. All of that is okay. But here's the deal. If all you do is talk about evil and don't do what's good, you're not helping anybody. The Bible says, how do you overcome evil? Do what's good. So here's the deal. Let's say somebody hurt you and they did something evil to you. You can go through life thinking about them, thinking of what they did wrong to you, thinking about how evil they are and what they did was bad and trying to tell others and prove your point. I can't believe so-and-so did that, blah, 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 and trying to make yourself feel good. Or you can simply do what's right. And what you'll find is when you do what's right, no matter what somebody's done, no matter what the circumstance around you, when you do what's right, you in your life, begin to overcome evil. And God begins to use you to be a blessing, to be a light in a dark world. So what's the practical step? Use your gifts. You may say, but Eric, I don't have any gifts. There was a story yesterday in the news that I saw about a guy who's paraplegic and cannot speak who uses Facebook to encourage other people. He doesn't even have a voice and he's able to translate and they're able to put it on the screen what he's saying to encourage other people and inspire other people. And he's inspired so many people that now people are taking a 3D camera and he's able, he's going to go on a sailing trip with this guy. And this guy's going to take him biking and other things. But why? Because he used whatever gift he had to bless others. What gift do you have? Use it to bless others. Others. And then finally, number five, most important point, if you don't hear anything else, if you need to wake up now, here it is. All right, Alan, you're back with us. Here we go. All right, here we go. Ready? Believe God for your future. Do you think God knows your future? Do you think he can take care of you? Quit believing the lies, your brokenness, that you're going to fix it, that you can do something about it, or by worrying about it, you're going to help, and instead say, God, I want to believe you for my future. I want to be obedient today. And believe you for my future. It's not just believing God not doing anything. But it's saying, God, I'm going to do what you want me to do each step of the way, knowing that you know my future. So this is really cool. This is in the story, the nativity story. This is when Jesus' cousin, well, Mary's cousin, basically told her, hey, this is why you're blessed. She didn't say you're blessed because you're having Jesus. She didn't say you're blessed because what was going to happen. Because Mary was getting ready to go through some terrible times. Horrible things. The family doesn't even have her in the house. You know, Jesus was born in a manger because the family wouldn't take her in. I mean, no matter how bad my kids are, if they're having a kid, they're coming in the house. That didn't happen to Jesus. You ever really think about that? They had to go to the hometown, Joseph's hometown. Weren't even invited in anybody's house. All their cousins said, uh-uh. And here's what she says, though. Elizabeth says, you are blessed. To Mary, because you believed what the Lord said to you would really happen. So now that's real vague for you, so I want to tie up the message with this one story. Because it's easy to say, well, I believe what God says. Let me give you a practical. When I first taught school, I taught in a really rough school in West Palm Beach. There were gangs. There were days I remember being out front, and the SWAT team showed up and threw a kid holding his arms and legs in the car. They were out there with guns. They gave me a walkie-talkie one day. Said, can you hide this kid in your room from the gang? And if you see them come over the fence, would you call us? What? <laughs> He's right here. You can have him. Right here. Right? There was a knife fight at school. The guy who took my position was killed years later. Okay? So, Right? So I used to eat lunch with this group of teachers, and every day these teachers would talk about how bad the school was, how bad the principal was, how bad these kids were, blah, blah, blah. And what they said was absolutely true. These kids were terrible. They were awful kids. They did awful things. They got in fights. They got suspended. I had a kid push me over a desk one day. I mean, this is a rough school, and I agreed with them. And then one day one of the teachers got mad at me about something silly, and I said, oh, I'm just not going to eat with them anymore. Started eating by myself, and then another group of teachers said, you come eat with us. 
And they talked about how to help the students. They talked about how to help the principal. They talked to me about one student whose mom and dad, he saw murder in front of him. And I began to go, oh. But I quit believing all the bad reports from the other teachers. I quit believing that that school was evil and these kids were evil. And instead I started seeing these children as potential of what God could do in their lives. And how God could change them. And what God could do and how I had my part to do. Now you got to realize in the middle of this, one day I'm teaching biology. And the, and the officer from the school comes in and says, can I use your scale? Which of course I said, sure. During class, he weighs crack cocaine to see if it's a felony. During my class, this is the school I'm at. And I said, how can I help these kids? Not these kids are hopeless. Why? Because I wanted to believe God's report about these kids and not what the enemy would say about these kids. And so I want to ask you, what are you believing about you? What are you believing about other people? What are you believing about your future? Are you believing God's report and God's word for you and walking in faith? Or are you listening to fear? God knows where you're at, even if you do something dumb, even if you've made a lot of mistakes, God can use those very mistakes to pull you out of the ditch and help someone else. Believe God's report. Your final step is this. God, I'm going to choose to believe what you say about the future. I'm going to choose to believe what you said today and not walk in fear anymore. Regardless of what happens. If you'll do that, you'll find that you'll begin to be filled with joy. That even in the roughest circumstances and the hardest times, you'll be able to say, I, it's not a fake joy, but I, but I have joy knowing that God's in charge no matter what. And the day that, God, that I die from whatever I die from, that I'll be in his presence and I can have joy today in every circumstance. If you'll do that, it will change you. It will change your family. It will change your neighbors. It will change your workplace. But most of all, God will use it to change you. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I'll be here after the service and I'd love to talk to you about what it means to surrender your life to him. Maybe you're watching online. I'd be glad to talk to you. Uh, uh, you can send me a Facebook note or an email to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian. But if you're here today and you're a Christian, I want to encourage you right now just to pray. God, help me to believe your report to walk in faith and not fear. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and your power. I thank you for using goofy me to be able to share what your word says. And I thank you for the power of your word that changes us, that reminds us of how much you love us, even in our brokenness and how messed up we are. You absolutely love us.